Alright, turn 29 of yet again Unto the Breach, and we stormed the, well not stormed, we attacked the province of Uruk. Now, here, this is the much more compact army we talked about having. A few of the chaff that will jump on the PD, these are PD jumpers as well, forward to bait any uh, last minute magic. And then a kill team of Sun Guards at the front, who will be jumping on their guard. We can see that once again we've got PD and patrolling force, I think this is mostly PD, in fact it might be entirely PD, uh, based on where it's positioned, and then the guard at the back. Um, so the god now no longer has any magic paths, but has received a bit of a gear upgrade. So we've got um, some reinvigoration in the boots. We've got uh, additional prot and defense for embrace the protection. We've got uh, better body armor this time. We've got low encumbrance, uh, moderate protection. This says that they're forging it themselves and doesn't don't have a huge amount of access. Horned helm for an extra attack and more armor on the head. I'm not sure if flyers can hit the head, you'd hope they could. And a mace of eruption, which gives an AoE attack. So we'll be killing a lot more quickly, but can't run the buff cycle stuck at 18 protection, and I think that's going to be critical. So, we spawn in, we run our magic, uh, we're preparing to cast anti-magic, which is our cure for the um, vice shield. Strength of giants goes off, so we now got these uh, lovely 26 damage uh, sun maces. Uh, striking twice, of course, because they are quickened, at 16 attack, and 16 attack is a good antidote to um, 20 defense. You'll hit reasonably often once you start harassing the target down. Taking some arrows, go in, drop, and you can see down to 146. Uh, so it didn't alpha strike him. Now the problem, of course, is uh, we'll start to uh, lose eyes, but we do have 15 magic resistance. So we have a chance of passing those checks, but the Sun Guards move in, we're losing eyes, but we are grinding down faster than the regen can swing through because we're hitting for a lot more damage and Sun Guards hit very hard in general. Down to 84 hit points. 63. And are these guys blind? No, most of these guys still have their eyes, thankfully. This one, I think, has yet lost both eyes, so minus 9, not minus 6. Ouch. And yet, still, 8 attack, 9 defense, and quickened, and you're harassing the target. So you'll still hit people even when you're blind if you're just really, really quick and elite. Swinging, swinging, swinging. Stunned dead. Cool. First and Forsaken Lion has fallen. Uh, long live the king. Holy Avenger goes off. And we can see the total losses in the end was we lost a Huron Priest, I think, to an arrow. Uh, six Condor, seven Sun Guards. So that's uh, two turns of production there about, and a fraction of a turn. So our sacred losses continue to mount, but in the end, we got what we needed. We killed the Anunnaki of Growth and Rebirth, and we're now besieging Uruk. Um, I just wanted to do that quickly before we talk about the rest of the turn. So Uruk is under siege, it's broken, we're storming it. Um, I haven't set the storm orders yet, but I believe we're storming next turn. Um, uh, yes, okay, so let's go through the rest of the turn and then jump forward. We've got some more Lightless Lanterns from Ulm. Um, I understand Ulm is now mass manufacturing Lightless Lanterns. Like, they're producing obscene quantities of them. because, And I know that because they're asking for very, very large quantities of fire gems. I think I'm sending something like... Oh, close to 30 fire gems this turn. I have 16 fire income. I don't know what their fire income is. So they're hungry for it. They have, and they're using the earth gems I sold them earlier to make hammers to make even more lanterns. So they're, they're going through a research explosion. They're going to fund us too. And they're going to give us much larger shipments of lanterns uh, now that we're supplying them more gems. They paid for some of the fire gems with uh, air and death gems as normal. Vanheim paid us. We'll talk about that deal in a moment. Summon condors, search for magic sites, found a copper cliff, which is one earth, one fire, and right now we need earth and fire, uh, and I think that was it for magic sites. Uh, random events, uh, unrest in Nazca, but that should have been immediately patrolled down. Uh, unrest, again, should be patrolled down soon. Heat doesn't hurt us. Uh, we earn no tax from Uruk, but that's okay, because we're not taking the province until next turn. Uh, magic... Um, great, and then we intercepted some scouts. So we saw some other battles. Uh, Orm gave us permission to uh, suicide a group onto them, and that just, you know, let us saw their army again. Um, battle in Uruk, as we saw. Uh, suicides against Ermor. Uh, we caught the last um, Urukian army that was coming in to try and reclaim some territory. We left an army there, and as a result, we intercepted and killed them. So Uruk is now completely out of mobile elements. Once we take Uruk itself and the other fortress, we are done. Um, we took the province of Lish. Uh, Scalaria sent a small raiding force against the Vanirushian army and predictably was destroyed because, like, look at it. Um, 
suicide. Chen Chi. Okay, so Chen Chi has joined. That's the last battle for this turn. Chen Chi has joined the uh, Salarian conflict by jumping into Dunster, and they're going to try and grab presumably some of this. Um, so Salaria is probably on the way out now. Um, Machaka was doing a great job on them, and then Vanarus has brought a very not insubstantial force in, which is fully capable of killing large numbers of skeletons um, through the combination of dual wield infantry uh, and evocation mages. And Chen Chi has this uh, very large army. And Chen Chi is uh, interesting. They've got a good block of their cavalry sacreds. Um, who have good hit points at this time of the year because they, they oscillate with the seasons. They've got a small communion going on in the back. They have an immortal um, and a good base of, of crossbows and some chaff infantry. But really, I think what's going to happen here is the cavalry will race forward and just lawnmower everything and take some friendly fire from the crossbows. Thanks, crossbows. So Chen Chi has joined. I reckon they'll at least get that fortress and probably pinch off this land as well. Um, but they'll also open up another front for Solaria, and Solaria will have to decide where they divert the last of their forces. So we're going to storm Uruk this turn. We're going to continue piping forces to the front. We're going to continue site searching. We so the arrangement we have made with Vanheim is um, they paid me 150 gold for the lost province income and the units destroyed when they uh, violated the nap and took uh, Lish, killing some troops there and denying his income for a turn. Um, They've agreed that they will step off Tiny Willow and allow us to take over the siege and seize the province. In exchange, they want all of the incomes and gems from the province in perpetuity. Um, and they want the province of Alluvia. They don't know how valuable Alluvia is. They presumably think it's more valuable than it is, but I'm happy to trade Alluvia off. Notably, this deal does not include a non-aggression pact, and I fully intend to attack them after I'm do I've done it. But... I, here's why I don't consider that to be disingenuous. There's, there's two separate issues at play here. If you violate a nap, if you're principled, in my view, you have to make that right, even if you intend to carry on with a war. Um, so the p payments of gold um, really is just to undo the damage of the nap violation. The territory exchange is like an exchange that happens all the time, and I'm going to respect it. Um, just because you exchange territory doesn't mean you then have a nap. Now, it might be suggesting in his brain that we're going to conclude one, but I think that's a long bow to draw considering he just violated one and I've expressed that I'm uh, not thrilled. Um, so we've agreed to this because it'll allow us to come forward, seize this fortress, and then make this our jumping point for the invasion rather than these two provinces here, and it will let us position more forces here, looking like they're here to break and siege the fortress, um, as cover for forward deploying them uh, and assaulting the heartland of Vanheim itself. Let's talk about why I want to go to war with Vanheim. Uh, there's there's two there's sorry there's three drivers. There's diploma, the diplomacy, there's economics, and there's military pragmatism. The diplomacy of it is that um, it is clear now that I'm about to have three capitals that I am emerging to be a major threat. Ermor is the other very large threat. In order to... If I immediately go and take out Ermor, which I don't think is in my capabilities because I have nothing up there, I have no magical counters, I think I get torn up. Um, if I did that right away, I would be vulnerable to people turning on me. Um, particularly, I'd be vulnerable to Ulm as my most powerful neighbour turning on me, potentially in alliance with Vanheim. Machaka is busy with Solaria, at least for a bit. So the biggest danger of a coalition at the moment is Ulm and Vanheim. If you're worried about a coalition of Ulm and Vanheim, surely the logical move is to ally with one against the other and thus guarantee that they're not going to turn on you because diplomacy has an inertia all of its own. Once someone's committed to something, it takes time, effort, and an injunction of energy in order to change their course, reduce that momentum, and make them do something else. So allying with Ulm against Vanheim guarantees that I won't be fighting both Vanheim and Ulm at the same time makes sense to me. That's the diplomatic that's the diplomatic argument. The economic argument is that now that I'm getting big, my ability to contain and prevent coalitions will become progressively more difficult. So I need to outrace the capacity of my uh, enemies in terms of my own economics. In other words, I need to get so big that at any given time I can defeat a coalition of the number of people who have agreed to attack me. As I get larger, more people will join that coalition, but they'll also just join it as a function of time. So I need to get really big really quickly in order to make sure I have the bulk to survive 
Um, as particularly if I get attacked while I'm eventually fighting Ermor to save my friends uh, Facia and Shinoyama, which I, I just, out of principle, I want to do. I want to save Shinoyama, I want to save Facia. Um, they're, they're really good blokes, it needs to be done. So that's the economic argument. Uh, Vanheim is very useful. And as a side note, um, giving half of Vanheim to Ulm makes Ulm really big and dangerous and makes it less likely that people want to side with Ulm against me because Ulm would then, with its long border with me, get most of the gains. And if Ulm beat me while in a coalition with, say, I don't know, Machaka and maybe maybe Relay, maybe Ermor, um, Ulm would then be basically unstoppable at that point. And I would break that coalition by saying Ulm is very large. I'm going to focus all of my effort on you small guys and he's going to get everything and you're going to lose and I'd use that to try and crack the coalition up. Um, and I'd, I'd follow through if I had to. So economically and diplomatically, it makes sense to move. Um, militarily, it's also, I think, a good decision. Even though Vanheim's not a great matchup uh, for Nazca, it's a good matchup. And most importantly, my shit's all here. My stuff is all in position. Redeployment anywhere else would require several turns of delay. It might require cancelling a nap in the case of most of my neighbours. Um, and it would give them significant amounts of warning. People would see units massing on their border. And if there are scouts that I'm not patrolling out, I'm doing my best to deny people vision. They would notice that I am redeploying. They'd see it coming. They'd build up. They'd redeploy. And for all those turns, my units are costing upkeep but not yielding me anything. If I attack Vanheim... My army is here. My army can move to Tiny Willow, fully deniably, because we need to break this. We then get another turn's grace um, from storming the fortress, at which point they will expect us to... With they will. That's when they can require us reasonably to withdraw, and it's at that point that we can attack. Seems reasonable to me. So, military necessity, economics and diplomacy all, all speak in favour of attacking Vanheim. Um, there's also a military point that Vanheim will get stronger as time goes on because they are a blood nation and they are summoning demons and they're presumably blood hunting. They're relatively large. They're scaling. So we'll talk about the offensive plan against Vanheim in future turns. But for now, uh, we're storming Uruk. We're trading with Ulm. We're going to make sure Ulm and Vanheim don't work together. We're going to get ourselves in Vanarus's good graces by killing the uh, person who threatens the most, which is Vanheim, and then not putting ourselves on the border with Vanarus which means that they're still happy that we're someone else's problem. Now, Ulm will become their problem, but, you know, maybe they're less scared. Of, maybe they feel that, in particular, because they're, they're based around lightning evocations, right? They're based around mass thunderstrike with these um, sages and their um, ability to throw thunderstrike. So there is absolutely no reason Ulm would scare them particularly much when they can just T-strike those, those black steel infantry lines. So Vanarus will be happy. Ulm will be happy. I'll get my continue to get my lanterns. Uh, and hopefully we'll fight a quick and victorious war against Vanheim. See you next turn as we move in and start considering how exactly uh, to do that. All right, turn 30 of yet again under the breach. And I believe I had, a, I had a brain fart last turn. So what happened was um, we didn't actually crack the, the fortress in Uruk last turn because what happened the previous turn was a lot of the, uh, the chaff routed off. We had to bring it back in. We didn't bring it back in in time because we were... Because um, that would then be involved in the battle. We needed them to not be there to overchaff the gods. So we didn't have enough siege strength present and surviving after the battle to crack it in one turn. So we brought in those units last turn. It's now cracked and we're assaulting it this turn. We're assaulting it just with uh, Punchao's unit, which is relatively small, and some chaff units. Uh, the other leaders are... Um, we've got one preaching because they may as well. Um, not going in, not risking themselves, no reason to. And if all goes wrong, it means we'll still be sieging with some other leaders and these units are here if there is any teleport intervention, shenanigans or whatever. So this turn, we're storming Uruk. Other events. Uh, we received one, two, three, four, five, six, seven magical lightless lanterns from all. And how many... Uh, six, only, we're only sending six fire gems. I think we sent like 30 last turn and we're sending them a crystal coin. Um which they have asked for in order to boost their astral access, and we were able to forge that for them as part of our ongoing and very uh, profitable trade arrangements. Normally, you don't trade this much with someone, but with almost forging ability, but terrible path access, and my good path access, we're natural trading partners, especially since I have the gen, come, gen income to uh, feed his forges, which is exactly what I'm doing. Um, what else is going on? Let's talk about the economy quickly because we haven't done that for a while. Let's talk about research goals and then let's talk about the ongoing uh, plans for the war. So back in the capital. Uh, this turn we're recruiting a Royal Malky. Our economy has gone way up. So 
Our economy has grown significantly over the course of these wars, as has our gem income, and our research is just spiking, along with our army size, which continues to accelerate more and more each turn as we create more and more slave summoners and continue to summon sacreds. So the, the size of this curve will also uh, increase, the slope of it rather. And of course, we're spreading our dominion quite effectively, which you know hurts our economy, but we need to do it in order to contain no more. So we're training a royal Malki and somewhere uh, elsewhere, because we've now hit construction four, we're forging a Huaka headdress, which allows them, uh, which you can already see I see dead birds is wearing, and that allows them to summon three Supaya a turn, which are collecting in the capital. Um, that means that Supaya, as we recruit more Royal Monkey, and it's quite quick, it's very expensive, but it's quite quick, um, we'll start to get more and more Supaya summoning going, we'll start production in Series 1 in the capital, and then we'll start introducing, as well as just sending through um, Upper Squipay uh, every uh, turn or two to pick up the Condors, Sun Guards, and Slaves from the capital, we'll also introduce a Huron Priest to pick up the Supaya and fly them to the front as well, which will introduce our Sacred Ghosts and increase Sacred Production, because at the moment we're bottlenecked, we get uh, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we get 26 Sacreds a turn, because our, sa our scales are so bad that even once we increase our Holy Points, we won't be able to recruit more, which is uh, kind of unfortunate. Elsewhere, we're recruiting a mixture of Research Mages, um, Path access mages, which are these enchantresses. We currently have a water, earth, nature, and a nature, water, air, which is continuing to forge us clams of pearls for our Koya and other astral mages. Um, and we're recruiting Huron priests um, in Xanthrast, and I think, no, not just Xanthrast for economic reasons, uh, close to the front so we can move them forward quickly. Um, we're produce we've moved our slave capturing out of Questra because there's a well of pestilence there and we're now doing it in Barra instead. So the economy continues to grow and it can now sustain us recruiting a few more Royal Monarchy, not for site searching, but to start getting Supaya summoning online. I think it's worthwhile now that we have Huaka headdresses and we can get three per turn rather than two per turn per 850 gold mage. Uh, the math works out to me. So we'll that's the economic update research wise. Uh, so we have const, const 4 and we're making a run to alt 6 now. We're now at 770 research per turn. Remember where we were a couple of turns ago? Thank you all. Um, we're running up to 7. That gets us a bunch of really useful things uh, along the way. But the real payoff at level 7 is fog warriors. If we can cast fog warriors, our sacred suddenly become much, 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 much more survivable. Uh, condors in particular benefit greatly from fog warriors against mundane weapons. So. That's what we're going for. We want Fog Warriors. Uh, we might use some Marble Warriors, but uh, and we definitely will use, now that we have Enchantresses, Mass Protection. Mass Protection is more useful to us than Marble Warriors because Marble Warriors only hits 50 uh, units because we use size 3s. It only hits 50 guys. Mass Protection, when we're using armies of 400, 500, as we will be, Mass Protection hits everyone and gives them uh, 10 protection. Now it gives them fire vulnerability, but the sacreds all have 10 fire resist, and we'll still have fire fire resist after you cast mat prot. Um, and we're going to, in order to cast mass prot, what we're going to do is we're going to get um, hopefully some a nature two. If we have to, we can do it with a nature one, but hopefully we'll get a nature two uh, enchantress. We're going to give them uh, winged shoes; so they can keep up with the army. We're going to give them a bunch of nature gems. Eventually, maybe a cornucopia if we can source one or two, and that'll be a mass protection caster because they can use a gem to go up a level when they're casting it. So that's that's the plan around alteration. It's mass protection on the way to fog warriors, and that will give us a much more survivable force of sacreds against most of the things that we're going to be fighting, particularly since we're going in to fight the lawn mowers at this point. Now we have cracked uh, Tiny Willow. We are storming it. Um, we're also moving um, more units forward. Um, in particular, we're moving a second Inca forward, um, and we're bringing more slaves and everything up. So the plan will be to use this province as a base and these units to hit a slew of provinces around here, whereas the troops from Uruk can hit the key fortress of Andoria. Now, we're going to be uh, equipping um, a... Oh, oops, here we have. Great. I, I thought they were here, but in fact, nope, brain fart, they're over here. Um, I only equipped them like a couple minutes ago. I don't know why I'm confused. Anyway, um, so we've got gear. Gear is Shade Mail, Horbogen, and Ranger's Boots, which gives the Inca a combined 40 stealth. And each of these guys is currently leading uh, small groups of condors, enough condors to comfortably kill PD. And they're going to come here, and they're going to move forward, and they're going to base here, which allows them to reach further into enemy territory and hit more provinces. The scouts will tell us where exactly we need to hit. 
But the idea is, if uh, our guapo remains in uh, 110, what we can then do is use our infiltrators to make sure that we hit every province that he has a movable link to and jump on the fortress at the same time. So if our guapo is evacuating that turn, he'll run into a raiding force and die. And if he's still in the fortress, he'll be trapped with no possibility of relief arriving in time before we can jump in, uh, storm the fortress and kill him. Our goal of the Alpha Strike thus will be to kill the god, neutralize this entire section, start to clean this up. And then at that point, we've already conquered most of our area of responsibility and we can move on their capital, leaving Orm hopefully to advance and keep these armies in situ, because this is where the majority of Vanheim's armies are. I hope they stay there. At that point, we fully expect to be counted with mass raiders, which is why I'm setting up large patrol groups behind the lines. Patrol groups will kill uh, moderately or poorly geared and non-geared raiders most of the time. If he sends well-geared raiders, then it justifies compensating, but I'm not sure he will, unless he knows this is coming, I'm not sure he'll be gearing raiders right this moment. I think he'll be focused on, on macroing and maybe looking at Orm with some nervous eyes because he's asked Orm for a nap and Orm said no, which is a pretty big signal that something is up. So we're massing forces. Uh, we're going to bring these, we're infiltrating our first units. Um, and then after we assault this, uh, we'll consider next turn and we'll consult with Orm as to whether we launch the offensive then or whether we simply, um, whether we stage one more turn of infiltration. We're forging a few more shade mails, which means if we bring further condors forward, we could create more infiltration forces, but I don't need many, just enough to cut the retreats and make life very difficult on turn one. Nazca loves an alpha strike, Nazca loves a blitz. We've taken down Uruk extremely quickly. It's turn 30 now. Um, this war took half a year, even with the massive reversals, and we achieved most of our territorial gain in the first half of the war. So I'm very happy with how it's gone. It's massively shifted our gem incomes. Our gem incomes are growing well. Um, funnily enough, the province I gave to Machaka has been attacked by barbarians, so Machaka's going to have to come back and kill those barbs again, which is funny to me. Uh, anyway, that's happening. So we'll come back in uh, turn 31. At that point, hopefully Uruk should be vanquished, uh, Ve Victus, and we can plan the offensive against Vanheim. All right, turn 31 of yet again Unto the Breach, and up north, Ermor has seized and templed a former Shinoyama fortress and is continuing to put pressure on Shinoyama. At the same time, Facia, who's been fighting a very noble came, uh, campaign, has had a number of reverses. Kalem's in the fight and is apparently doing really well, but I'm not sure how long that will last. And on the basis that uh, my mates are in trouble and I need to get, get my shit together and done quickly, um, I'm deciding that this turn is the turn in Orm agrees um, to, for me to go into Vanheim. Orm, in fact, went last turn. Orm went last turn because Orm is apparently in a hurry to... Uh, I, he, sa he said it's about making up for the fact that he went a turn late last time. I think what's actually going on here is he wants to make sure that he secures his fair share early. So Orm has moved in. Anyway, let's go through the turn in order. Magic Armor of Knights from Orm. I asked for that in case I decided to thug someone up. I've got to un-request it. Um, we won't be thugging anyone. But Armor of Knights costs Orm one gem. I think we paid like two or three for it. And we'll just put it on a valuable mage and leave it. It's a good set of armor. Um, good set of lanterns. So Orm has told me that he never, he will never send me more than half his production for a turn. He sent me three, four, five, six, seven, eight lands this turn, which means he, he must be producing, what, 17 at least, assuming he wants a majority share, not just 50-50. And then he's also sent us a Dwarven Hammer, which we, we paid for and we're going to keep paying for. Um, so Orm must have a huge huge manufacturing array for their lightless lanterns at this point in order to support this. And ironically, well, not ironically, it's the whole idea of behind trade. So we're feeding their habit. By paying them far more than it costs them to produce lanterns, they can afford to produce more lanterns for themselves. And with the rates we're paying, every couple of lanterns we buy not just pays for more at their base rate, it also means they can afford to produce some just using master smiths who don't have hammers for three gems. Um, so every time we buy a lantern from Orm, we're actually pay we're giving him more than one lantern in return. 
which means we are creating a research monster over here in Orm, albeit a research monster that is friendly and is dependent on continued infusion of Nazcan gems. And look, this is the nature of high stakes diplomacy in Dominions. You accept that uh, a trade will make both of you stronger and you understand that because there are so many other players in the game, there's probably a benefit to you of pulling yourself up over the 16 players you're not trading with, even if you remain steady or fall slightly more behind the person who you're benefiting in your trades. That's my logic anyway. I stand by it. Some people in the community disagree with me. Anyway, we received a magical Thistle Mace from Machaka. This dates back to our initial nap. Our initial non-aggression pact agreement, I stipulated that I would eventually get a Thistle Mace. I eventually, I wanted a Thistle Mace because I only get N1 native. And if I didn't find N2 anywhere, uh, a Thistle Mace would allow me to turn one of my N1 natives into someone who could create more Thistle Maces and give me wide access to N2. So I will be duplicating this Thistle Mace uh, using Thistle Maces and Hammers, the hammer I just got from Ulm, in order to produce uh, more N2s which will help me uh, cast Mass Protection. We received a wing helmet from Facia, which we paid for with air gems. Uh, the winged helmet is an important air booster. We'll use it later, but for right now, while we wait, uh, we're just putting it on our guard and using it to get more condors per cast. We've researched Alteration 4. We're going on Alteration 5. Research is booking it now. I love it. Um, only one uh, magic site found this turn, but it was an air gem site. So we're up to 12 air gems, 16 fire. 6 water, 9 earth, 12 astral, 9 death, and 9 nature per turn. Uh, good incomes good incomes across the board, a bit weak in water, but we've got it building up a stockpile. We ideally want more earth because uh, Orm is very earth thirsty and we'll take basically everything we get. We're just keeping a few in reserve for things like um, earthquake later. And fire, again, he's eating everything we get. I'm talking about eventually going eternal pyre just to feed Orm's fire gem addiction. Anyway. So that was that. Then there was a series of battles. Uh, suicide against Man. Vanarus moved a army onto against Solaria and won. Uh, we sieged Tiny Willow and won. We lost two Condors and 22 Hatun Runa. Three Spearmen. Eh. So that was one fortress. Tian Shi attacked Solaria. So this was a much larger Solarian force this time. And this, I think it's worth seeing the Tian Shi. So this is Hedalus. Hedalus is a very good player and knows how to handle a communion. Um, the only weakness here is he'll suffer some damage from the slingers on the wall because he's using a lot of weak old man mages. But he's sending in his um, he's sending in his blessed red guards as his front line. His communion has formed. The banishments are dropping. And I think his guys are mostly casting buffs and evocations because he's decided not to not to risk casting anything that would kill his own troops in large numbers which is perfectly fine. And what's going to happen here is... Oh, there's the gift from heaven. There's the rocks from the sky. Took him a while. So he'll suffer some friendly casualties from that, but he didn't know if there was anything particularly bulky here to hold him back. Solarian cults are running. Walls are cleared. So, 14 uh, red guards died. 12 imperial footmen. 1 geomancer. Maybe an overstressed communion slave. Not bad. Good kills on the immortal. Good kills on the celestial master. I presume this is a prophet. Got 51 kills banishing. 492 kills against Solaria. 29 Solarian cultists in the dirt. So this proves that... So Solaria can't be researching much at the moment. They won't have new counters. They're basically gone because um, all they had was chaff and their chaff is... People have solutions to their chaff and that's a problem. Uruk. Uh, we'll watch it for the value, but there it is. We lost, I think, three sacreds doing this, but it's an important moment. Uh, Uruk fought hard, Uruk fought well, Uruk came up with a supreme uh, super combatant that we weren't ready to deal with straight away. But really this is just a group of mages, we've already killed everything in the back. There's a Mushu Mushu standing at the front, uh, more crocodiles, oh, I killed more crocs. I'm a bad Aussie, I'm a terrible Aussie. Um, but we just we just kill everything. Nazcan military superiority is, is pretty obvious now, I have to acknowledge that. Um, so we seized Auric and we killed a bunch of scouts, including... We're killing a lot of Kalian scouts. Like, we're killing a lot of Kalian scouts as far abroad as here. So, Nasogen, what you up to? What you up to? Nasogen may be... This is a sign Nasogen may want to feed intel to people in order to get them to attack me if I'm paranoid, but... 
that would actually be a reasonable call. Either way, I don't want anyone knowing what I've got because they'll see these giant armies and know that I've got as much as I do, and I don't want them to. I don't want people to realize that that's what my army size is doing. I don't want them to know that. I don't want them to know how good the economy is. How I definitely don't want them to know about research. In fact, I'm going to negotiate with Machaka if I can and try and buy one or two lightless lanterns when they go on the market. Um, just because that'll imply I'm not getting, you know, 10 from anywhere else per turn. So I'll buy some at inflated prices just to keep keep appearances up. Anyway, let's talk about let's talk about the offensive against uh, Van Heim. So this is going to be the second trial of our sort of alpha strike techniques, coupled with uh, two sneak and attack operations launched by our forward Condor groups. So what we're going to be doing is launching. Uh, we're going to claim the throne because we need the money from, we need the growth instantly from the Throne of Guy, and we want to start getting our Dominion pushed here. Now that Uruk's Dominion has disappeared, there's a race to fill in this void while it's very easy to fill it in. So we're still going to claim the Throne. We have, uh, we brought up another Inca for the purpose of taking forward the army with his plus three morale. He's leading like 11, yeah, 11 morale Hatun Runa, like decent. Anyway, we've got a couple of, we got, uh, two key objectives in the first move and then a bunch of raiding objectives. The two key objectives are uh, 110. 110 is on the receiving end of a good block of sacreds and enough siege chaff that we should crack the uh, crack the fort in one. It doesn't look like there's a huge number of units here. There could be glamour units. They're unlikely to be patrolling, but that's where the god is. So we will trap him and crack it and assault it if he stays there. If he moves, he should run into 33 condors here or 33 condors here or 100 units here, including 50 Lancers and 50 Hatun Runa. Uh, we picked ex more experienced Hatun Runa in general because they have slightly higher morale, um, so they shouldn't run as quickly as the 7 morale crappy ones. Um, and here we've got 80 units because it was viewed as a less likely place for him to go. So we're going to hit 1, 2, 3, 4, and the province itself. So wherever he goes, there's a good chance we get him. I think he has enough movement points that he could make it to here through this plains, in which case we'll miss him, but that seems like an unlikely move. Might also make it to Vanheim itself, but we're going to try. We're going to try and come off and see what we can do. We're also raiding these two provinces over here because we have excess Hatun Runa, and it just gives him more shit to deal with. Um, this will is unlikely to be defended, so we're just sending a, a basic force. This one gets a slightly larger force, but again, just Hatun Runa. Just units that cost basically nothing for me to put together. I, I have as many as I need. The number of Hatun Runa in service, I haven't bothered counting them. I might count them next turn before uh, the battle reports are processed, or after the battle reports are processed, rather. Um, but I have enough Hatun Runa for every offensive military operation I want to do, plus about 40% of the patrols I would ideally want to do. But anyway, we're launching those offensives. Uh, all looks like they've seized 149. All looks like they've seized 147. And Vanheim attacked Solaria. So if he's out of position, it'll be up to him now whether he pulls off Solaria to deal with Ulm or like who knows what happens there. Anyway, that's our plan for our initial offensive against Vanheim. The idea is, again, a bit of a hammer, full, hammer blow to strip one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight provinces uh, on turn one, which is not bad when the enemy has 20, a bit under 20 provinces now that Ulm has seized two. Um, really rapidly reducing his war fighting capacity. Orm will maybe assault this or maybe capture, put more territory under siege either way. We're ready for the raiding counterstroke at some point. We're bringing up more... We're bringing Hatun, Runa and Sacreds and everything forwards. Those will become our response and patrol groups to catch uh, the raiders that will inevitably come from Vanheim. Vanheim will absolutely send Glamoured Thugs uh, to raid us. That would be the number one counter, I imagine. But what they can't stop us doing and this is the critical part. Vanheim can pick apart individual provinces. We can take them back with groups of Hartoon Runa. We can follow the thugs behind. If we guess there are movements, we can kill them. Like, we'll wear his thugs down just using groups of incredibly affordable slaves. Might interrupt our site searching a bit, which we're doing um, up here, but, you know, you, do, you work with what you've got. Like, we'll adapt and overcome there. But he can't stop me taking the forts. He can't stop me cracking 110 and storming it. He can't stop me cracking 124 and storming it. There's no way for him to reinforce in time, except for sailing from here to here, and there's not a force here ready to respond. So these forts are basically guaranteed takes, and from there the capital is, significant, is, is seriously under threat. 
like we have a serious beat on the capital at that point, we can hit the capital with one move from both 110 and 124. And there may even be a case, depending on what our intelligence shows up in the first stage of the offensive, what the uh, what the Zesda teams and whatever do over here. Um, based on what we see, we may even not storm on the turn one and immediately go to lock down the capital. I want this war to be fast because it's not exactly going to lengthen our front. All it's going to do is add relay another bo a border with relay instead of a border with Vanheim. Like that doesn't really matter to us in terms of overall threat. Uh, and a narrow border with Kalem. So Kalem could be tempted to attack us, but they're deeply engaged in a war with Ermor and um, Ashfordel. And so far as high inertia war goes, war with a pop kill in that sort of grindy area, uh, where it's basically the death and where you're winning and thus unlikely to want to give up is uh, is a big deal. So. Next turn we'll be launching our offensive against Vanheim. Our war against Uruk was an unqualified success, but of course we lost like close to 90, 100 sacreds in the course of the war. I did a quick count and I think I have slightly more condors now than when I begun my attacks against Uruk in the first place. Um, that's that's about right. I would have ideally liked to have more going in against a, uh, an opponent like Vanheim who's had a couple extra turns to build up and who has more uh, antidotes to the, the Condor problem. Even though I'm bringing more online myself, they're not quite ready. But we've managed to keep up with casualties. We have more chaff than when we went in. We have more mages than when we went in. And we have about as many Condors as when we went into Uruk, and slightly more Sun Guards, I think, than we did before, although the Condor Warriors are, are starting to go extinct, which is uh, no no great loss for me. Anyway, we'll come back in turn 32 and see how the offensive went.